hard to believe that this is the end of our first series of Think Inside the Square. We've had a few series draw to a close at Council. Um, the First Nations Roundtables came to a close the week before last. Um, and this is our final Think Inside the Square of Series 1 um, for this time. And we'll be back a little bit later in the year. Creative Connections continues on. Um, we'll just wait for a few more people to join us before we get going. We have the biggest panel we've ever had before, so I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. I feel like I'm looking at a ginormous Brady Bunch screen, which is <laughs> lots of fun, but I'm just not quite sure how that will go. Um, I hope we're being joined by some of our regulars. Don't forget to say hi in the chat box um, when you join us. Yeah, and I can see the rain's about to start again. My place gets quite noisy, so I will mute myself when it starts to rain and hopefully remember to unmute myself when there's an opportunity to have a chat. Um, and you might see my little cats run in the background as well. They've become a little fixture during this time as well. Or I think we might actually kick off for today because I think we've got lots and lots and lots to talk about. So. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Celia Pavelev, as you know, the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Australia Council for the Arts. And I'd like to acknowledge the Camaragal peoples, the traditional owners of the land from which I'm coming from you today. I'd also like to acknowledge the many nations throughout Australia that we are gathering from here online once again, but for the last time in this series to talk about culture platforms and adapting digitally. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge all First Nations peoples present and online today. Thank you for joining our final session of this first series of Think Inside the Square. 15 episodes and four months later, here we are celebrating the wonderful digital experts, innovators and thought leaders that have kindly given us their time and expertise as panelists over the last 14 weeks. Our topic for this week is virtual experiences. What else could it be, seeing we're all here in person, but also virtually. Um, and once again, we're coming with a Zoom session coming to you live on Facebook. Um, today, we'd like to celebrate some of the previous panelists from episodes one to eight. Um, but we'll be returning also with a series in August, our second series of Think Inside the Square. We'll have a brand new look we'll have new ideas and we'll be talking about the digital evolution that we're all contributing to and part of. Um, so just a little housekeeping, I guess, again, before we get into the session. So if you're joining us from Zoom, you have the Q&A box to send us your questions. And please, this session is all about you, the audience having a, a lovely say and uh, telling us your reflections, your insights, your highlights. And there's the chat box if you're joining us through Facebook as well to post. So we'll be winding those questions and those comments in throughout the entire session today. A little bit different today. We're not having PowerPoint presentations where it's open slather. Everyone's welcome to join the conversation at any time. Um, we have closed captions available through Zoom by clicking on the closed captions icon in the bottom menu bar. And we're also joined by our Auslan interpreters, David and Shaboy, who will be interpreting our session for you online. So today, let's kick off. Um, this is where I'd normally introduce each panel member, but we're not going to do that because we have too many people. Otherwise, I would just spend my time doing bios and you've met everybody before. But if our panelists would just like to, when you speak for the first time, just introduce yourself and just the tiniest little intro to who you are and what you do would be really helpful for any of our guests joining us online that haven't been with us before. So I'd like to just start with a big open question to everyone. Um, we're all a little bit different now, 15 weeks or four months on, we're a little bit more connected and we're a little bit wiser, wiser for having some successes and some challenges. How, who would like to start off and introduce maybe something that has made them a little wiser, a little different at this time? Well, 
Oh, oh, okay, I'll jump in. Hi, it's Jackie Bonner. I've got my own marketing event, comms consultancy. Um, for, for me, I've always worked from home. I've, I've had my business operating for over 20 years now. So I think what I've found uh, interesting is, uh, working with people and helping a lot of people, including my many clients, uh, how to negotiate and navigate that. And I think a lot of people have, have struggled, uh, finding it difficult just from the day-to-day -day routine, uh, just from getting their basic tech sorted up, that sort of thing. I found um, interesting how there's another world out there that's now just emerged completely. Um, that will That is challenging and great and flexible and depends on your circumstances. So Jackie's from Jackie Bonner Marketing and I've known Jackie for many years and our arts marketing has gone on lots of journeys over the time. Mm -hmm. the, the journey of arts marketing for the future, do you, well, how do you think it will or how have you seen it adapt just in this very brief time knowing that it's, we don't have audiences in our venues, we don't have audiences necessarily, some of our galleries have gone back, others are trying to work out how we bring our audiences back. What, what do you think, or what do you think is going, is the, not just the greatest challenge at the moment, but also the greatest opportunity? I think one of the challenges, and I did a bit of, um, John, I probably saw on my Facebook uh, last night, I did a bit of a vox pots around um, my mates and industry colleagues uh, about how everyone is feeling about going back in. Uh, there's still a lot of, um, some people are very flexible, are okay with it, and some aren't. I think there needs to be much more engagement with your fan bases, with your subscribers. Um, the streaming, as everyone knows, has been very hit and miss from a production point of view. Uh, I don't think having um, less than optimal experiences is a great thing to do for your brand and for, for managing the future, which is fine for bigger orgs, but it's, it's a challenge for the smaller um, production places and smaller venues and smaller arts companies. Um, I think the opportunity is just to engage and really a time to really understand what your audiences want, what your subscribers want uh, and really deliver to that. Uh, it, it's, it's become quite crucial and I've been noticing it from different um, organisations that I'm involved with just from a, a ticket buyer's point of view. Uh, there are some of the larger organisations, I think, have, have really dropped the ball on this, where there's so many opportunities to engage. But then you see some of the smaller companies. Um, there's one that Kath Alcorn put together something, the Re Reservoir Room. I'm not sure if anyone's seen that. It's just a cabaret setup. They've just installed in Paddington Town Hall and they're streaming it and it's very intimate and it's gorgeous and it's live and they have incredible engagement with their subscriber base at Facebook uh, fans so that's going really well for them but um, it it's tough it's been really tough uh, one of my big issues with my clients both here and particularly overseas I've got some fairly large international clients uh, <laughs> is this going to end um, <laughs> it's particularly difficult for international as you could imagine um, and also talking to someone just recently who's working on Blues Fest uh, yeah it, it's hard to know where we're going to go but there's so many opportunities to just engage further to really understand um, who, who your audiences are and to, and to structure your offering accordingly. Let's bring in some of our venue folk here, Stuart and, and Jonathan, two different types of venues and two different stages of, of, of work with your venues. Um, Stuart, what, how, how do you think you realise it differently? Will you keep doing what you're doing now? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing now? Yeah. And, um, so, um, so I'm head of digital programming <coughs> at the Opera House. I've been in that role for about six months before COVID started. Um, the premise, I guess, for the digital work that we've done <coughs> is fairly specific to the Opera House, which was um, when venues started to close, the kind of provocation that I put to the, to the various teams was, how do we keep the lights on and keep going? How do we maintain a semblance of business as usual or, or, or normality using digital as the de facto stage, if you like. Um, and so whilst we've achieved that, 
that doesn't obviously then continue when when the building reopens. This is a, a, a particular solution for a, for a particular time. But I think, I mean, you know, there are many, many insights <clears throat> arising from our experiences. Um, one of the key ones, I think, is that, you know, the amount of time that we invested in programming and production, we almost have had to set aside the same amount of time in education. And I mean that in, in internal education, as in what is it that we're doing that, that needs to be approached differently from, I don't know, from comms or production or marketing or, or what have you, the amount of education required to kind of bring everybody up to speed in terms of, you know, what this, what, what presentation of performing arts work in the digital sphere means and how it differs to, to a live event, how it's promoted differently and, and, and so on. Um, and I found that incredibly, uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, it's, it's not a negative experience, but it's a, the amount of time that was invested in that area was significant and actually significantly more than I think we anticipated. Never mind then also the amount of time you need to invest, to Jackie's point in some respects, in educating the audiences that, that this is, you know, both similar and different or, or, you know, what is this that you're putting in front of me that, um, that, I, that I'm to be engaging with. So, um, you know, I think that education piece cannot be underestimated um, because we're just not at a point where um, either operationally or from an audience perspective that it's just a but yes, we can flip from a live event to a digital event. We can just morph our, our processes and systems and our marketing. We can port that across easily. Um, you know, that's that's just not the case. And I think our, our experience, I appreciate that's potentially somewhat unique in terms of the volume that we've done, but, we're, but I think we can quite readily then therefore see those parallels between what a live week looks like and what a digital week looks like. Um, and where they, you know, compare and contrast. Jonathan, so you're not so much turning the light back on, but turning the light on being in your yes. role at this particular time. So tell us a little bit about what it is meaning for you in getting that light, act, turning that switch on and, and getting in there for the first time. Sure. So um, my venue is 50 years old, Gara Civic Centre in regional New South Wales, and I'm in the process of transitioning it from a hall for hire model into a professionally run venue. Um, so being close has given me time to get on with some of, of the stuff that needs to be done, um, identify some of the improvements that need to have happen to the centre to bring it up to speed. And it's been great having that time. Um, uh, at the same time though, I'm now really itching to put something on. Um, and of course I don't have any product to be able to uh, even try and go digital with at this point. Um, I'm having to try and think up projects that can be done digitally, but that's going to take time and I have been successful with some, a small amount of funding um, for a digital project, which doesn't have to be delivered until June next year, which is kind of good because as Stuart was saying, there's going to be a lot of education time that is going to have to go into it because this particular project has to be done completely digitally. There's not allowed to be any face-to-face -face, uh, work at all, um, not even to get contracts signed or anything like that. It all has to be done in an online world, uh, which is going to be an interesting learning curve. Um, but I've been using the time to slowly build audiences and start to educate those audiences on some of the possibilities of what they might see uh, live in the future um, and the kind of, of arts experiences that are happening elsewhere. I've found that there's a little bit of a culture of, well, you get that if you live in a bigger regional centre or if you live in the city, but there, there's no expectation that the people of Cowra should be seeing such things as well. And so I'm having to try and change that. What's been positive is that some people have said to me, I'm loving what you're putting up on social media or in the monthly e-newsletter, where I have been saying, look, here's all this other amazing digital content uh, that's coming from around the world and particularly Australia um, that you may be interested in, you know, spend some time uh, watching this and, and listening to this. And um, the feedback has been small, but, positive, which has been great. I just wanted to pick up on the point that um, Jackie started talking off about media. I think one of the things I've seen that's going to really impact regional venues 
is the change in the media landscape and about 40 title uh, newspaper titles that have been shut nationally. Um, and the real change there, and there was an announcement, I think yesterday about a new model uh, with one local uh, regional um, journalist kind of in each town kind of thing, who will deal with local news and then feed it to an online model. But that appears to then be sitting behind a paywall. Um, and I think there's going to be real challenges in how to communicate, despite the fact we've spent all this time learning how to connect and navigate the digital world. I still think people are more disconnected than ever before, um, ironically, from being able to uh, find out things that are on in their local community. Um, and I think others are going to find that too, as the media landscape changes. Um, the other thing I just wanted to talk about for me that's been really valuable during this time, particularly as I'm one, like I'm the only full-time staff member, I've got two casual staff and that's it. Um, uh, the networks have been really valuable for me um, and connecting to people on a more regular basis than we would have otherwise because of physical distance. Um, that's been really valuable and it's been an opportunity largely for me to shut up and just listen to what others are having to say and, and um, collaborate with those other people um, and learn from them, which has been really key. So um, I don't feel like I'm an expert in any field whatsoever anymore um, or, or really uh, at all, but it's given me the opportunity to learn from others, which is invaluable. So um, yeah, the other hard challenge I think I've probably had is that managing expectations of council as a council owned venue um, and managing the expectations of when we can reopen and, you know, when the doors open, oh yes, they'll all come flooding. No, that's not the reality at all. Um, uh, and just because we can open our doors doesn't mean the product is ready to go. Um, and trying to explain how that all works. That's um, fun. <laughs> I'm sure when that light goes on, it, it will be fairly wonderful. And I don't think anyone feels like an expert at this time. I think we that is something else that's really connecting everybody. There's been no rule book for this particular time. And I think the value of our networks, and I think we've drawn from our networks in, in amazing ways. And I think, Elliot, you're well-placed to share a little bit about how Little Lunch Online has worked and drawing those networks together. And then we'll hear a little bit from Tara about her pivot to back to the physical space and how that actually, how she's addressing that in, in this time of um, physical distancing. But Elliot, tell us a little bit about the, the networks and where that's, where Little Lunch Online has gone over the last four months and what you're thinking for the future. Thanks, Celia. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Elliot. I'm joining from Turbul Yagara uh, up in Brisbane. Uh, I'm a mid thirties, Caucasian male wearing a black t-shirt with the Stranger Things logo on it uh, in my living room with my bookshelf behind me. Uh, it, it's been an interesting process for the Arts Front team. Uh, we've been working particularly with uh, Sarah Moynihan and Norm Horton from Feral Arts uh, on the Arts Front project and we, we identified really quickly that um, the kind of disruption of closures and cancellations um, was creating a, a very, uh, maybe uh, people were feeling very disconnected from each other. Maybe that was more exacerbated by the speed at which everything kind of shut down. Um, and we, as an organisation that had a strong focus on, uh, you know, technology and connecting people and uh, sharing ideas, we, we saw ourselves as fairly well positioned to create uh, something fairly simple that could connect people together. So we started the little lunch online events, which were week daily, 30 minute sessions. Uh, originally started with the idea of being able to present work, um, but actually fast became more about conversations that the sector wanted to have uh, and were really needing to have. So that was quite an interesting process in and of itself. Um, we wanted to be able to present work and pay artists in a period of time when it was difficult for artists to get work. Um, but th of course there were limitations with things like uh, Zoom, you needed to really know what you were doing in order to be able to play an instrument and sing at the same time on Zoom, for example. Um, but also we found that there was a, 
a strong sense in the sector that they wanted to have some important conversations. And so we, we kind of adapted the model fairly organically towards working with a range of different organisations, party, you know, different people to allow them to essentially co-design or co-create the program. We saw our role as more of the platform. We were the, the kind of technical support in the background that would, you know, assign closed captioners every 20 minutes and make sure the YouTube live stream was running uh, and we were getting audio out. Uh, and actually what was happening in terms of the conversations going on through Little Lunch Online was far less about what we were curating and more about what the, uh, the community that was growing around those events wanted to talk about. Uh, people would come to us with topics or ideas that they wanted to explore, people they wanted to get in and talk with, um, and we, would, we were very flexible in how we could respond to that. We could basically do anything um, and work with anybody who had a conversation that they wanted to talk about. Um, one of the things we learned very quickly, though, was that programming a daily event, <laughs> uh, even if it is online, is a massive undertaking, especially... Uh, you know, in that kind of circumstance where as, as kind of Stu's flagged uh, and Jackie, that we were doing a lot of work around helping to uh, educate some of the people we were working with on how these kinds of formats worked, how these kinds of platforms worked, um, what, you know, and even really basic things like um, where you should position yourself in relation to the natural lighting in your room, for example. Um, you know, we were doing all kinds of stuff around helping people learn and understand how to use these platforms for these kinds of purposes. So um, what we've kind of seen is that over time, the half an hour format that we'd looked at just wasn't enough to really have those kind of uh, the level of conversation that people wanted to have. Um, so we took a short break. We took a couple of weeks off and spent some time thinking about what it was that the Little Lunch Online events were doing. Uh, and we're now moving to a model where we'll look at um, longer events, uh, let fewer of them, so a, a lower frequency, but focused around those kind of big, deep conversations that the sector wants to keep having. Uh, and no matter what happens, whether we end up going back into lockdown or uh, as people kind of start to move back to work or we move into a more hybrid model, I think there's still going to be a lot of uh, need to keep having these kinds of conversations that... I mean, I know people have kind of said a lot, but the idea of kind of returning to a post-COVID world, I just don't see that happening. Um, so now is it time to be thinking about, well, what does that, what do we want that pre-COVID world to look like? Do we need to fly everywhere to do everything? You know, can we start building up infrequent flyer points rather than frequent flyer points? Um, so for us, it was, it was very interesting to kind of work in that way because it demonstrated a lot of what the Artsfront project and the Artsfront team would you know, we're very good at. And it, it was interesting because it was building up to, we're running a conference in November online over a whole month, um, entirely delivered online. Um, and in lots of ways, it's kind of been a bit of a precursor to that, thinking about the kinds of topics that might form part of that event, uh, the way that we might deliver some of it, um, and the kinds of parties that might be involved in it. So, you know, I know there's a lot of us on the panel, so I won't say too much more, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions that people might have about the Little Lunch Online events. Thanks, Elliot. I, 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 I think the power of conversation has also bubbled up, hasn't it, at this time? The fact that we're here, this has been very much led by conversation about questions, about talking, and it has really evened out the space, but nothing, still replaces, I think, being in person. And I think that, Tara, I'm quite quite excited to hear that you're on the cusp of opening something new that does involve being in person. And, and that's a little hard to imagine in New South Wales. And, and Yeah, totally. Well, I guess, I mean, it might be hard to imagine here. So I guess a couple of things. I'll talk about Electrolab in a second, but this idea of programming or streaming for me what I'm quite interested in now is the idea of creating sort of, I'm calling it natively digital works. So stuff that's created and within the digital space. So rather than taking something that exists elsewhere, I like this idea of creating a, another type of interaction using what we've got already rather than trying to translate our real 
physical lives into the digital. Um, but yeah, trying to set, so Electrolab is a space that I'm setting up with Michelle Brown. Uh, we're both artists and educators, and it's going to be a space for workshops in creative technology. There'll be long-term and short-term things like Arduino and, but also AR and VR. Um, I was, one thing that's let me focus on this actually is normally I travel loads to perform and do work. So not being able to travel meant that I've had really solid time to focus. And that's what's, I guess, contributed to making this happen now. Um, a lot of the things I do workshops in though, have a lot of health and safety issues. So trying to translate them across to digital won't necessarily work. Um, some of it will. And we're, so we've it's sort of changed our content a little bit. We'll be doing things like AR and VR or software teaching is a bit easier to do online than perhaps a soldering session. Um, but yeah, we're having our opening in two weeks and at the moment trying to manage all the restrictions and uh, is, is interesting. <laughs> so we're having uh, our space is at, it's at Backbone Youth Arts. They've um, at the East Brisbane Bowls Club, they've also got a shed on the other end of the bowling green, which is now gonna be called Electrolab. And we're having our opening, most of it's gonna happen outdoors, uh, largely because restrictions, we're lucky here with the weather, but also our, the restrictions are a lot less if we're all outdoors. Um, our space is quite small, so otherwise only maybe like 10 people could go in it at a time otherwise. Uh, then in the evening, we're moving indoors to the bowls club space uh, where there's a bar and we're having some music uh, one of the restrictions is that no one can dance. And for me, music is a lot about dancing. Well, a lot of the music I was going to program, I'm like, I don't really want to sit and listen to, like, I, it's nice to sit and listen, but you want to feel it and you want to be moving. So we've changed what we're programming to things that suit sitting down. And we're also going to create some lying down spaces for people. Um, so I think sort of shifting the focus of what we would program, um, but also uh, organizing an event that might not happen. Like in a week, things could change and we might have to cancel everything um, or come up with an online backup. And that's also interesting. And on the other side of things, we're also then gonna be live streaming the event. So sort of in the opposite way to getting everyone to play from home, we're also keeping those wider audiences and international audiences, if they're in the right time zone, uh, can participate. Um, yeah, and I guess in, in terms of programming as well, with Live and Solo at the Bolo, I was able to program internationally. So it was great. I could just, you know, I had such a wide range of artists where now I'm focusing local again and I've been back in Australia for a year. So it's now I'm having to sort of put a lot of research into trying to meet people only online to find out who can play and who's doing what here. Thanks, Tara. One of the things that Renee did over the course of programming the panellists and, and our guests for, for these sessions is a lovely mix of venues, administration, artists, formats, um, specialists in the digital field, like an, a, an extraordinary array um, from all of you. And you, Tara, you actually reminded me to correct myself from something that I said on Jonathan, on the back of Jonathan's comment, is that we, we have actually all become experts at moving really quickly and adapting super, super, super quickly and rethinking those formats and rethinking content. Um, and there's a couple of um, panellists on today that will tell us a little bit more about their content and how their programs have adapted and changed. Travis, who will we'll have a little chat with Travis first, and then we'll hear from Frank um, about one of the programs that the Opera House has been running. But um, another expert in Animal Crossing, I understand. Travis. I wish I wish I can't invite anyone to my island yet. It's still pretty shabby. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Travis, I'm a Gamilaro man um, and the founder director of um, awesomeblack.org, which is a, um, a First Nations run uh, non-for-profit who that um, is a platform for uh, First Nations digital content creators um, with a particular focus on podcasting um, and, and gaming. 
Um, one of the things, so we, we started um, Awesome Black uh, in response to COVID, um, but it was it was a long time in the works anyway. We had been um, uh, researching and kind of putting the model together for about 18 months. Um, I run a, and co-host the podcast for Originals, which is a comedy show with my brother, um, Texas. And one of the things that we've been sort of uh, experiencing over the like 18 months is like, well, we put out a, we put out a hour solid hour of kind of comedy content every week for our show and we put it out for free. Um, and one of the things we would do to uh, monetize it would be like hold sort of 10% of content back. So every year we'd kind of uh, hold uh two episodes that were like special secret episodes and people would pay to access them. So we put out all of our like online content um, and then, and then people would pay a $2 uh, a month sort of membership fee um, to get the special stuff. So what, like what that was about was like a building a fan base and a community base through the free stuff and then moving to a monetized content for that extras. Um, and so what we wanted to do with moving from Bro Originals to Awesome Black was sort of uh, increase the scale of that and increase the sort of uh, audience sizes that we could access by um, sharing audiences and cross-promoting across other podcasts and um, digital content platforms um, with First Nations people as the focus. Um, so we got together with another amazing podcast, the Ash podcast, um, and, and started Awesome Black. And so that website like sits as a sort of access panel for audiences um, where they can kind of access various First Nations podcast work. Um, and then as a platform for the creators to like share skills and knowledge. Because um, one of the things that we like kept coming up against over the last few years was like, we're always told to go and see a white person to get uh, expertise on things. And I was like, well, no, screw that. We actually have a whole range of various First Nation experts within the industry um, that we can rely on and uh, learn from there. And we can share that knowledge within ourselves and create those networks. Um, and so like Awesome Black kind of acts as that uh, knowledge base and a really easy network for the creators within there to um, access each other and draw upon um and so like uh with covid over the last i mean i was on the panel back in this on the 7th of may um and and i think like i uh i very much tried to run before i could walk with awesome black and um like i had been kind of researching it for 18 months and putting it together but like with covid i was like okay i'm gonna supercharge this and get it all done now and um actually kind of like I burn out a bit and I've, I've spent a good few days in the last few months, just, I think staring at a uh, blank wall uh, in my house. Um, I think like part of that has been uh, a lot of the black lives matter pressure as well. Um, because obviously that's been a big kind of effect in the industry, particularly with first nations creators. Um, I, and yeah, so like we're kind of, we're pulling in other people now and getting that content up and running and like building those networks. Um, but yeah, it's been a really interesting sort of ride the last few months. Thanks, Travis. The, the, the power of the networks, it, it's extraordinary, isn't it, at, at the moment, I think, for not just connecting, but distributing that information as well and working out where you where we all need to um enhance our knowledge and our different um yeah knowledge bases i guess and i just did want to add when i said that we were all experts in pivoting before i meant pivoting in our own time of course um because i do acknowledge um from from one of the guests online that um it has been very stressful and moving quickly not everything does necessarily go online or need to go online. Um, Frank, how about an update from your world and the Creative Leadership and Learning Program? Uh, cheers, thanks, Celia. Um, amazing to hear such, um, 
such varied experiences. So yeah, so I, um, <clears throat> I run a program at the Sydney Opera House called the Creative Leadership and Learning Program, which is a school's outreach program, essentially sort of a community cultural development outreach program. We work with schools to help them sort of think about how they can use creativity um, in sort of all aspects of their, their learning um, community. And um, <clears throat> one of the, we did move very quickly. We pivoted as quickly as we could. Um, that word of the day, that word of the kind of the last year really pivot because our primary kind of concern was um, with the shutdown was that all these artists we were employing would not have a job. And, um, and, and so that was, that was terrifying, watching people's livelihoods kind of crumble. And so we did move really quickly and we, kind of, we, we said to the schools that we were working with that we could honour the contracts we had with them. And, um, and we said that sort of with, um, you know, <laughs> um, fingers crossed, um, believing that we could. Um, but there was a little bit of... Um, I mean, we did some very early research in how to use kind of um, Zoom or a video conferencing platform to kind of do socially inclusive participatory arts work. And we sort of felt that it was possible, but we went to the schools and went, listen, we can do this. We can, we can honour the contracts. We can work with students while they're at home or if they're in the classroom. And we can work with teachers because we work with teachers a lot. So running them through participatory arts processes to kind of help them think how, about how they can use arts-based practice to translate that into teaching practice. And so that's, it's all about being in the room. That sort of, that type of socially inclusive arts practice is about the vibe, the room, the energy of the, the people and, and, how, and how you build languages around moments that happen, which are, which are specific to that, that, those tiny moments in, in time and space. And so putting all of that online was, was interesting. And what we, we, we spent, 10 days with different artists basically um, going through a process of investigation where we, we, we developed a sort of care factor rate rating system where if we tried, we tried things that we, we thought would only be possible to do online. Um, in that same sense, the way Tara talked about it being natively digital, we thought, well, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it properly and it's got to be something, it's got to be more than just a a facsimile of, of reality. It's actually got to be genuinely interesting and, and authentic to this space. And so we, we, we tried to make Zoom a medium and, um, and, and some of it really worked. Some of it was really exciting. Some really kind of, you know, just fun, silly things like, you know, telling, telling kids that we were going to play hide and seek and you had to pick up your laptop and run, turn the, you know, turn the video off and run to a space in the house and then turn it back on, you know, you had 20 seconds to get there and then you had to turn it on and we had to guess where you were and you had to tell a story about where you were or everyone had to lie on the ground and, and turn the video off and someone would tell a, a, a ghost story and, uh, and everyone had to make the sound effects. And so things that were only possible through the medium of, of, of this space and like we played with the rename function a lot. So doing these big scrolling poems where everyone turned the, the video off and then played with renaming themselves. And so you had these and they constantly responded to questions. And so you got this scrolling poem on the screen. And so things that, uh, and, and, but then things, we tried loads of things that absolutely flopped as well. And, and we came up with a series of guiding principles about what would, about how we could then design our work and, and how we could help the teachers design their work. And those guiding principles um, were, were kind of obvious. Um, they were things like less is more and kind of, um, you know, keep it simple. But probably the one which was the most, um, the most uh, helpful was, was keeping it, was always making sure there was an analogue in the digital. So as much as we wanted it to be natively digital, um, we found that the more analogue we brought back into the digital space, the more interesting it was. And so things like running away into, into, a, into another area and really then focusing on what was around you and, or, or bringing a piece of like some, something, making things together, you know, where everyone's cutting and making, crafting together. And then, um, and so it was when, whenever people were actively involved in real world, well, and not, well, not real world, but kind of everything's real, digital's real too, but kind of um, things that were tangible, that that really um, had a big change on the way that people experienced the digital. And so just reflecting back on, on your original question, Celia, the, I think one of the big shifts, which, um, which I guess I've noticed through that work is that I think 
that the way that we value the digital experience as we move forward will have ch has changed. I think um, digital has always been seen as a, as a value add to programming, particularly in somewhere like the Opera House. So it's something which is, you know, it's going to extend the experience. It's going to prolong the kind of life of the artwork and get more views or get more eyes on the work over a longer period of time. But I'm hoping now that people will see that the digital component of a work is sort of implicit at the conception phase when people are dreaming up a program, you know, a show which is going to happen live, that there's something about it which is digital, which is not just a value add, but that kind of, because we've all kind of, you know, we've all had to dive into this new world and, and hopefully that that will have an enduring effect. And so, pos and so that's where I, I reflect on the, the idea of the, the analog and the digital and the digital and the analog hopefully will continue to do a little bit of a dance in the next couple of years and people will come up with all sorts of wonderful ways of, are playing with those two things, but it won't just be one and then there's another. They'll really be kind of seen as 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 kind of you know holistic of, of um, in one event. Yeah, I think there's definitely. Um, I, I think that's a shared vision. I think that we're all stepping toward. Um, but that lovely concept of dancing is coming up again. That some places we can dance and some places we can't. Thank God we can still dance in the lounge room where nobody is watching. But somebody who's winding all of this up together is, uh, and, and working with council on our digital transformation strategy is, is Mark Cameron, who I think was episode one by memory um, again, yeah. and came to us recommended from another very dear colleague to Think Inside the Square, someone who was integral to its formation, David Finnegan from Sensix. Um, but Mark, tell us a little bit about your experience, what is different for you in this period, because you're not necessarily, you're not from the art sector um, originally. We've wound yeah. you to our, our world, um, our network here. And like I said, we've got all sorts of people that have joined us as panellists over the time. So just to go back to that that, that first question, what, what's a little bit different for you and how have you connected and, and what's made you a little bit wiser in this time? It's, it's yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I was so sorry to give a bit of background about who I am. So I, I run a company called W3 Digital. Um, we're a digital management consultancy. So we advise a lot of uh, businesses and business leaders on their path through digital transformation and technology change. Um, and that's, you know, so we're looking, we work a lot with enterprise organizations, government, um, higher education, um, in the medical space, health space, et cetera. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and definitely being part of the process um, to develop the digital transformation strategy with the you know the, the arts council has been incredibly insightful. I think you know, there's really, from my mind, there's really kind of, um, we in many ways we're we're a society going through digital transformation right now. We're a whole the whole sort of country is having to go through it in a way that we never have before. Um, you know, we I think we. We were somewhat shielded from the from the, the financial financial fallout in the you know, the GSC, um, but this time around, um, the you know we really do have to start making some big moves, and I think the the broader Australian um, society is having to go through that, and of course that's creating a lot of pain um, and a lot of issues as we go through it. But I think there's kind of you know there's with all the people that I talk to who across you know who are making decisions in the digital space and the, and thinking about what they do, whether it's you know, at a startup level, or it's you know in the arts space, or it's in you know it's in a government organisation, or it's at, um, the CEO of a large organisation. It's um, we've I've sort of dividing it into a few different areas. I think there's the ones who are making decisions that are purely based on fear, um, and and kind of pretending things aren't happening. And I think those are the ones who are not doing particularly well. Um, I think that there's there's a bunch of people who are who are constantly talking about when the thing's going to return to normal um, and they're also not doing particularly well from a just a psychological standpoint I don't think because I don't really think there's going to be a real return to normal like these these moments in time push everything forward you you know we don't go backwards time only goes forward so you know no matter what what happens with the COVID situation the landscape's going to change in some way um, and then I think there's those who are who are grabbing this opportunity, you know, this moment right now, and turning it into a big opportunity, and and trying to turn it into, um, you know, trying to understand it and use it as their as their you know energy to push forward into into a new space. And I think those those people are doing incredibly incredibly well. 
I think there's also kind of a real big difference between the people who are focusing on digitization versus digital transformation. And digitization is kind of like, just how do I take stuff online? Um, you know, how do I do what I've always done, but, but add a bit of online to it? This is the one that go, how do I make the most of online tools to change the way that I do things? So, you know, digital, digital transformation is more about culture and thinking and positioning as opposed to um, just, you know, just moving a bit of this money from one place to another. Um, I think that probably the last insight I'd say um, is, is I suppose it's it's the one thing I think is you know if we look at the government and look at look at the government in at a um, you know a federal a federal level and a, and a state level I think what it's done has exposed what what the reality is is like everywhere you know I think you know in many ways you know we've got this view that there's you know there's people in you know dark suits sitting in back rooms who've got the world sort of you know completely sorted out and everything's you know everything's being planned and sorted out for a reason then all of a sudden a crisis like this hits and we have digital uh, technologies which is making information so much quicker and we realize that actually you know the veil's been pulled back and we realize that everybody's when in moments like this hit everybody's kind of making it up as they go along and doing just doing the best that they possibly can do um, and having to invent on a, on a daily basis just to be able to keep up with with what's going on um, and some of it works and some of it doesn't yeah thanks mark i think that insight into digitalization versus digital transformation and articulating that i think we couldn't i think we need to keep reminding ourselves about that the number of times i've heard digitalization or going digital or what pivoting means but then actually what it could mean or what that what we should be planning for and adapting to and what adaptation means at this time is something to take time to answer you don't need to have that answer um, instantly However, we do have a, a very instant 13 minutes left. So I'm going to try to work through some of the questions quite quickly. So bear with me. Um, Frank, I'm just going to throw each very quickly to you as I can try to navigate the, the boxes with the many, many questions in them. Frank, would you continue offering digital sessions once things go back to normal? Um, Anonymous attendee found your found it very your your insights very interesting and that the the results that you previously shared also very interesting. Uh, yes, but I think we really will really play with how we do. It. We we will definitely continue to explore the analog aspects of how we deliver the digital. Um, as confusing as that is, I think it's important that we keep those two things alive. But we are talking with about doing a pilot next year. Um, with uh, with um, schools on the north coast, they're, they're they're sufficiently far away for making the analog really difficult. <laughs> so I feel like that's a good that's a good balance. Cool, Travis. Two questions for you. Your website looks great. What platform did you use to build it, and how did you manage to get through the funding bodies with your new concept? Um, on the website, uh, it was embarrassingly maybe a WordPress site um, that I um, have kind of designed in the back end myself um it thanks for saying it looks great um i'm still not happy with it uh and am upgrading it as we go every day when i when i'm not staring at a wall um on on getting through to the funding bodies that's been really tricky um and uh i think like with podcasting um and gaming videos and youtube videos they're still not necessarily seen as an art form so to speak um and so like as much as i can you know have uh conversations directly with the funding body he's like like uh, like i can you know pick up the phone and chat to lydia miller at australia council um and she understands it's getting the understanding of these sort of new they're not even new technologies that's you know they've they've been around for ages um but getting them through to the people assessing the grants um, and like getting on these panels has actually been really helpful um, for that and like just kind of continuing to talk about what we do and why we do it and the background to why we do it um, and also like positioning it as art form rather than marketing because I think like digital has been used so long as a marketing tool to send people to the physical product um, but now the digital is the physical product and it has been for a while, but I just don't think we've been using it that way in Australia um, to its full potential. 
Cool, thank you. Elliot, roughly how many people were involved in the delivery of the lunch online and 53 sessions is incredibly impressive. Uh, yeah, 53 sessions um, may not seem like a lot, but when you're doing them every weekday uh, for several months, it's, uh, it's quite an undertaking. Uh, the team was actually relatively small. Uh, so it was Sarah Moynihan and Norm Horton from Feral Arts uh, were particularly focused on uh, organising the events and working with different uh, you know, people and organisations that were interested in hosting events. Uh, the three of us worked on things particularly like the technical planning and uh, the technical delivery of the event during each little lunch. Uh, and we also worked with Melissa Robinson from Arts Nexus, who uh, looked after our team of artist closed captioners. So we, we worked with a group of about six uh, artists who, uh, who did the closed captioning for us. We had um, a company called Auslan Stage Left, uh, who provided the Auslan uh, on a contractual basis. Uh, and then we had a whole range of individuals and organisations who kind of put their hand up to host events and uh, to speak on different topics. So uh, a fairly wide network, but a fairly small core. Cool, thank you. Uh, Stuart, do you feel like the Opera House has benefited after going digital in the way that you have? Um, well, I mean, the Opera House is such a many tentacled beast that um, you know the answer is probably yes and no and, and, and very long and extended. I mean, the Opera House, you know, has been presenting live streams or, or certainly from the um, education side of things, has been working in digital programming for about ten years. Um, you know, so this is certainly unprecedented in terms of how we presented the work during this period. But um, you know, digital programming as a, a, a kind of art form area and, and work stream has been um, long standing at the house. I think that's probably you know one of the main things that um, I think uh, we've benefited from in, in, in terms of our unit is, is a greater understanding of what digital programming is and can be. Um, you know, there's and, and also an appreciation that there's two very, very different strands of digital presentation and we're kind of doing both simultaneously, perhaps confusingly. You know, one of which is just pointing a camera at the stage and capturing what's there and you know, live streaming that content, you know, and that's fairly straightforward. Um, and, you know, is, is definitely, um, I think, geared more towards, I think what even sort of Travis was alluding to earlier, that's sort of more of a marketing exercise in some respects or an audience development exercise in terms of here's the work we present on stage and now you can watch it through your TV, for example. How we've benefited in, in, in that area, um, not just in terms of new audience, I think, but I think one of the kind of key uh, responses we've had is that existing audiences watching other art forms or genres a type of work that they hadn't hitherto been exposed to. That's been one of the kind of um, really interesting uh, feedback, I guess, in terms of that. People, you know, accessing things that they weren't accustomed to. The second strand is, of course, creating work for screen, original digital work. And that's really what, you know, my team sets out to be, is, is to think of, of digital as an art form in and of itself, rather than just a presentation vehicle for, for what's on stage. Um, so, you know, we've, we've learned um, how to, you know, in, in terms of that education, we've had to talk about those two things almost quite separately and try not to conflate the two things, you know. Um, and I think going forward, the live streaming part will continue to be more of an audience development exercise um, rather than a sort of, you know, uh, digital first project if you like um, and but we'll continue to endeavor to do new work in, in that space as well including podcasts and, and so on um, so yeah so the, you know so many different facets of of the house and its audience has benefited I, I wouldn't know sort of where to begin um, perhaps to answer some of that question but um, yeah we you know we like, I think like you said Celia you know we don't purport necessarily to have you know, done this fully successfully or to have all the answers or to, you know, to, to walk away and think that, that you know, job done, it, it's caused as many questions as it's answered, you know. Um, it's given rise to as many arguments as it has to solutions, um, you know. And, you know, we also recognise our place of privilege as, a, as an organisation that is essentially an arm of government to, to some extent that's funded 
in that way so that we were able to present the work that we did in that way. They were able to pay all the artists and they were able to pay for licenses for all our work. And, you know, so we're privileged in that respect and, and also understand that not everybody is able to do that. You know, we did what we did because we were able to do it. Um, but it's not necessarily a model that um, everybody else can, uh, you know, can, can duplicate. No, um, the remunerating artists and, and organisations and staff within was a part of an earlier conversation on chat. And I know, Jackie, you were part of the, this, this conversation just a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it, it ties in with the concept of co-creating, doesn't it, in the sense of the programming now, tying in what you were saying, Stuart, it, it, whether it's the creation of a piece to be consumed online or whether it's the adaption of a piece in person to consuming it online, where the audience sits and where the audience is participating with that those pieces now does is going to need another lens of co-creation on it I, I think moving forward and potentially the impact of that on audience development Jackie might be something as yet unexplored and it might be something that needs a whole different lens again applied to how we then would market that necessarily there, there's huge opportunities for all of this. I mean, one thing I did want to point out um, is the accessibility as well aspect of all of this online and digital content. I do do work for Arts Access, so I'll declare that. But uh, it, it's created so much amazing content and there's been, you know, questions about why hasn't this always been available? We've always been sitting here, we can't go out. So it's important that everyone thinks about that as well. Uh, about the broader audiences out there in the community, but um, uh, everyone's just going to have to become a bit more savvy, I okay, particularly with the, um, using the online mediums with marketing. There's going to be so many more interesting apps and um, content creation, all of these different things that are coming out now that are just so much more accessible for, for artists to use, to venues for use, and that's I think, is going to be a great thing as well and has been a great thing I've seen already. Yeah, I have to, the accessibility and be able to reach diverse audiences right. and new and different audiences. Um, Jonathan, speaking of audiences, um, what do you think are the benefits of digital engagement for regional artists, organisations and audiences? Um, so I'm just going to jump in with Jackie's uh, point there. And I think um, one of the things that I've been really been thinking about is the fact that programming has to look at programming for audiences that are in person, but also for the future audiences that are online. And sometimes they'll be the, um, they'll cross over and sometimes they may be different things altogether. Um, sorry, and I'll now go back to the question <laughs> that you asked. Um, uh, um, but I think regionally venues are probably, and arts organisations are probably still struggling with this and have been looking to the bigger, um, more funded organisations for leadership um, and to see where we can fit in and how we can achieve similar things but for, you know, a tenth of the budget. Um, I think it probably will make some of the venues look at collaboration or, or the organisations look at collaboration more and whether there is content that is then shared across multiple venues. So in fact, it may be, um, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here, Cara Civic Centre and Dubbo and Shoalhaven and Port Macquarie, who are then presenting um, a product that is for all of those audiences, but in a digital platform. Um, and I think, uh, those conversations are kind of hard because sometimes we've, there's been a tradition of holding back for that big reveal of a season or, you know, an idea. And, and I think we're even still too scared to uh, open up about ideas that we're having because we're slightly worried that someone might run away with that idea. Um, and I think we still need to learn to share openly and maybe in the same way we accepted that privacy was dead when Facebook came along, 
Um, maybe we need to look more at, you know, Creative Commons and collaboration um, for the greater outcome rather than just the local focus. So long as from a budget point of view, because for many venues we're um, connected with uh, councils. In fact, 80% of venues in Australia are council owned, which comes with a whole heap of challenges, particularly around the political area. But um, trying to explain what, how council venues can collaborate in that sort of way when probably councillors and, and powers that be don't necessarily understand the benefits of that. Um, yes, so I think that's uh, probably something. I mean, one of the crazy ideas that kind of came out, I think, of the session that we did with Jackie and myself, um, and then further thought was, you know, do we need to actually have a, um, a second life venue um, where people can interact in, in virtual reality goggles, whatever, from the whole experience that we're used to of being in the foyer with other people, um, having a drink, sitting next to, be, being aware of sitting next to other people um, in the theatre space and watching a performance and all of that still happens live, but we're all as avatars. Um, you know, please, if there's someone who's got the money, maybe Mark, you know someone who can run away with that idea and make it happen. I don't have the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I've played a gig where we did it like that. Everyone came in with their avatars and there were little avatars on stage performing. And it was totally different to just watching a stream or playing a stream. Um, it was using Habbo Hotel. Broadcast using a 360 camera. Cool. Um, I, Jonathan, I think um, one of the interesting projects that happened a couple of weeks ago that I hope that we can um, continue on in some form was the uh, Playwriting Australia's Dear Australia project. You know, that was, I think, a fairly unprecedented collaboration between 25 small to medium arts organisations and, and five major performing arts venues um, to, to come together to present that work. Um, and certainly from the Opera House's perspective, it gave us the opportunity to you know, showcase that work to our audiences um, who perhaps hadn't been exposed to it. And, you know, many of those um, organizations would have been um, regional organizations as well. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's something, there's a kind of nascent um, idea in that execution of Dear Australia that I hope that we can continue as an industry to collaborate together on a digital outcome, um, you know, because it, it's, it's shown that it's feasible. And particularly, you know, with, with Dear Australia, those 30 organizations all distributed that program simultaneously. So it wasn't just a, a success from a you know, curatorial or, or programmatic standpoint, but also from just the reach, the number of people that were um, able to, to see that work was phenomenal. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's something really interesting in there um, that, that I hope will um, have some sort of future iteration. Thanks, Stuart. Well, we're almost out of time, but I am going to do one final quick whip around the panel. And I'm going to ask you to answer in one sentence or less, one silver lining that has come in the digital space um, in line with um, the theme of our Think Inside the Square. Um, I'll give you five seconds to think about that while I do my thank yous for the session for the series. I would like to thank David Chavoy and Alyssa for your interpreting of the sessions. Thank you so much for allowing our sessions to be even more accessible. I'd like to thank Renee and the communications team and the rest of the Australia Council for not only having the idea to get this series up and off the ground, but to actually execute it and execute it so well. I would like to thank all of our online guests. And today I've tried to track where many of you have come from, Las Vegas, Philippines, Singapore, New Zealand, Toowoomba, all around Australia, New Zealand, um, pretty much the globe, really. Um, so thank you. Um, I'll throw to you, Jonathan, for your little silver lining. Um. Uh, I guess probably is just keep collaborating and, and keep talking and, and, and think of your networks as an extended um, uh, part of your team, really. Lovely. Travis? Uh, I'm in panic mode and can't think of one. 
So, <laughs> Elliot, um, yeah. Elliot will have one. Um, I think one of the best things that I personally think has come out of it is that um, some of the more mainstream part of the art sector is really thinking about digital as an opportunity and part of their creative output rather than as a sideline to what they were doing. Do it. Uh, Elliot nearly stole the words right out of my mouth there. You know, that was uh, <laughs> but instead of being, you know, somewhat sitting on the outside, that it's, uh, that it's a central part of the, of the programming and presentation mix. Tara. Oh, um, there's so many things. I think accessibility. So uh, what like accessibility and programming, but also in the accessibility for everyone to be watching dependent on their needs and requirements. Um, and also we're finally achieving the 90s dream of living the digital lifestyle a little bit. I feel like I'm back in the 90s. Mark, your silver lining. I think it's made us question our and question and think about our relationship with technology and, and digital platforms um, and, and helping us think about how we you know work around them. Frank. I think it's something about stay stay completely open and experimental with these forms. See them as play as as um as opportunities and see them as places of experimentation and analog in the digital. Analog in the digital. <laughs> <laughs> Becky. I think as a community, the arts workers uh, across the board, the artists or whatever, it's been great to be more engaged with everyone and they're all in the same spot. Um, no one's got it easier than others. Uh, the accessibility, Tara, is bang on. It, it's not just about us being at home. It's people who are disabled. It's people who are too old to go to venues at night anymore. It's just brought up so much more opportunity and content for them to see that I'm really in the past have been an ignored audience and, and I'm really pleased to see that they now have access like everyone else does. Thanks, Jackie. And Travis? Um, yeah, I just, I, I think like the, the f conversation around digital sovereignty and like First Nations uh, stuff there for the future, I think like that's a really um, great silver lining, the focus that's been had on that um, in the industry. And I think for council, one of the many silver linings is bringing everybody together regularly to have conversations that we haven't had before, connecting us all who may have been too busy doing other sorts of meetings to actually come together and tackle some of the challenges and look to some of the opportunities that lie ahead and, and in front of us. Anyway, I think that might wrap us up. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for your generosity, your spirit, your kindness, your insights um your laughs don't forget to keep dancing i think it's very important that we all keep dancing until the next series of think inside the square thank you all take care bye